Do not be afraid. Praise the Lord. Beautiful song. As you're probably wondering, I don't look like much, much like Mark Bugby. Mark was not feeling well today. He does not have COVID, some other things. So he decided to call me this morning and ask me if I would fill in for him. You know, friends, if you're not feeling well, stay home. If you have some symptoms, stay home until you understand what you have. And let us keep our community safe, continue to practice good health. Remember, we have a health message. Let us utilize it, strengthen and boost our immune system, and then things won't perhaps overcome us. I invite you to bow your head as I kneel down and pray. Gracious, loving Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath. Yes, we had some snow. It reminds us that we can be washed white as snow. You're ready to cleanse your people, Lord. This morning, direct our eyes to that most holy place. May your spirit move us and fill us, convict us and direct us. Give us an understanding of your will this morning, Lord. Open our eyes to perhaps things that we have not seen or maybe we don't understand, things that may need to change in our life or things you would have us do. So this morning we come in faith, Lord, because you said to gather this day and worship thee. So bless us now, Father, as we open your word and we take this journey with you this morning. Hide me behind a cross and may your voice be heard. In Jesus' name, amen. It seems that God's people are often being reminded not to forget. As I was looking through Deuteronomy early this morning, the first few chapters, I kept seeing this word, lest ye forget, this phrase, lest ye forget, lest ye forget. And so I decided just, you know, type in forget. Do the word search there in Deuteronomy. And, and, and nine times it says, eight times regarding uh, being expressed to Israel, one time that God's saying, I will not forget. And over and over, they're being told, lest thou forget the things which your eyes have seen, lest you forget the covenant the Lord thy God, that is made with, that what he has made with you, lest you forget that how God has prospered you, it's to be used for his glory and for his honor, lest you forget and you think that you got it in your own strength, your own wisdom, your own might, lest you forget that he has brought you out of the land of darkness and into his marvelous light. He says, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in, in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and statutes. Remember, Deuteronomy 9, 7. Remember and forget not how you provoked the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou did depart out of the land of Egypt until you came unto this place, you have been rebellious unto the Lord. Moses was telling, he's laying it out. They're about to go into the promised land. The, the, the generation that was to go in before them, they've passed off the scene now. But Moses is pointing out to them, you haven't been much better than your parents. You've been murmuring and complaining and kicking and screaming the whole way. Now, lest you forget, he says, over and over again, he'll tell them, lest you forget. And especially remember how you provoke God. And I think it's in Psalm 78, it says that they limited God through their unbelief. Can you imagine that? Mortal man limiting God? Did you know you could actually limit God? You could limit what he could do for you in your life through unbelief. And so they were being told over and over again. And the last thing, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 25, God tells them, do not forget to totally get rid of all the Alamakites. And they don't. 
The Amalekites are permitted to continue to linger in the land. And what happens? Centuries later, it comes back to bite them. Because you read in the book of Esther, Haman is an Amalekite. And so they, they lived on and on their lives. They forgot their message. They forgot their purpose. They forgot why God called them out of darkness. They forgot. They forgot. Lest we forget, friends, why we exist as a church, let us take heed to the words and his, that he's left us on record to encourage us along the way. Today, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to John chapter 9. We're going to look at a, a, one of the a really interesting story here. It's, it's packed with uh, meaning. It's filled with hope. It's filled with encouragement. There's some warning in there for us. But I'll tell you, there is a lot of blessings for us to reap out of it today. John chapter 9. <clears throat> See, the Pharisees, Israel as a nation, they, they forgot. And, and God never leaves us without hope. He never leaves us without a, a messenger. He never leaves us without encouragement. And so, eventually, as the prophecies were foretold, as Jesus would come one day to remind his people, again, why they were raised up as a nation. What was God's purpose in sending his son to bear the cross for you and I? And so, all along in, in the Gospels, we see that Jesus is constantly laying before the, the Pharisees and before the people evidence. What is he laying before them? evidence of who he is and why they exist as a nation over and over again he's seeking to awaken their mind to turn them from their prejudices to to heal them of their pride john chapter 9 starting with verse 1 and jesus passed by and he saw a man which was blind from his birth and his disciples asked him saying master who did this who did sin this man or his parents that he's born blind and Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So he's laying it out right before him, right there in, in the hearing of all those around him. And there's this blind man. He's setting off to the side. He's probably just sitting there. And he can hear this conversation taking place. I've come to work the works of him that sent me. What were those works from the beginning of the foundation of the world? It was to, to redeem man from the fall, to restore him back into God's, into God's image, God's likeness. God is a God. He, he's a creator. He loves to create. And he loves to restore. And so that's why Jesus came. He came to restore. And when he had thus spoken, he sped on the ground and he made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, I want you to put yourself in the place of this blind man. You are hearing this conversation take place. You're hearing about this man that says, I am the light of the world and, and you're blind. You've never seen light. You have not a clue what light looks like. You cannot even conjure up in your mind what light looks like. You've been blind from birth. But you're thinking, what does it look like? What would light look like? You hear the birds singing. You hear people talking. What would the birds look like? I smell the flowers. What would they look like? Can you imagine the anxiety building in his heart as he hears Jesus talking? He's probably heard of him going around and healing people before him. And he hears this the next thing he feels is something being rubbed on his eyes. And then he hears these words. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which being interpreted, sent. Now this doesn't make sense. To you and I, this would not make sense. If you and I were that blind man, it just would not make sense. How is this going to work? I've been blind from birth. You, you make some clay. I hear you spit. You make some clay. You put it on my eyes. You tell me to go wash. What's that going to do for me? I've been washing my face for the last 38 years. I still can't see. 
It doesn't make sense. You know, friends, sometimes God's going to ask us to do something that does not make sense. We're not trying to, we're not supposed to figure it all out. Well, how's it going to work? A, B, C, how am I going to get to Z? How's that going to work, Lord? He didn't think about it very long, I don't believe. I'd imagine he rose up, grabbed his little stick, starts feeling his way around. And you know what? I don't think he went to the pool alone. Because I believe somebody was standing there and had compassion on him. They heard what Jesus told him. They thought to themselves as well as he was probably thinking, well, I know it's somewhere in that direction. And then there probably was a whole bunch of obstacles in the way. But he went in faith and somebody came right alongside him and helped him on the way. I'm sure of it. They got him to the pool, helped him down into the pool, and he washed his eyes. Could you imagine as he opened his eyes and he saw the light, as he saw people's faces? Could you imagine the joy that was running through his heart, how excited he was? I'd imagine he just jumped up and down. I don't know about you, but if you were blind from birth and you went and washed your face and you came back seeing, what would you do? Would you be happy? Would you be excited? Yeah. Yes. Yes, joy would fill your heart. You could not wait to go and tell somebody. You'd be anxious to go and tell someone. I remember when I first realized there was a God. You know, many of you heard my story. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't even know who Jesus was. I didn't know there was a God. I didn't understand any of this stuff about Christianity. And the night I realized there was a God... As messed up as I was, I picked up the phone and called some people in another town. Hey, are you guys up? It's 2.30 in the morning. I'm coming over. And I went to tell them about this God I just discovered. I knew very little about him. But I was so excited. It's amazing when you discover what Christ has done for you in your life. Friends, I want to encourage you. Do, do you know how to give a five-minute testimony? If you don't, I want to encourage you to go home this afternoon Kneel down and pray and ask, Lord, may your spirit move me and help me write out a five-minute testimony. What was your life like before you encountered the living Christ? I remember one time I was doing some trainings and I was down in Indiana in just church speaking <clears throat> and I, I shared this, this concept about writing out a five-minute testimony. And the, at the end of the service, this lady came up to me and she said, uh, um, Dennis, um, you know, I, I didn't have a life like yours. I'm like, well, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you didn't. She goes, so I, I don't know how, I don't know what to write. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, I, already, I grew up in the church. I've always been a Christian. I said, really? I said, have you lied once? Well, yeah. I said, have you coveted it once? Yeah. Have you lost it once? Well, yeah. I said, okay, so uh, let's begin right there. What made you surrender to Christ? What was it that, that it, what experience was it that, that you came to the point where you were all in? Oh, okay, she said. She got it. You see, friends, there comes a point where we, we, rather we're born and raised in the church or not, there comes a time when we meet the living Christ and it's transforming in our lives. And if you haven't had that experience, I encourage you to get on your knees and say, Lord, give me that experience because it will be life-changing for you and it will be influential in your life in reaching others for Christ. So you can imagine the, the joy in this man's heart and he runs home, and he tells his neighbors, he tells his family, and they're baffled. Verse 8, the neighbors were, uh, the neighbors therefore, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, it goes on, and he came back seeing the neighbors therefore, and they which were before him, seeing him, that he was blind, and said, is not this he who sat and begged? They, some said yes, some doubt it, some said he looks like him. You see, when you encounter the living Christ, a transformation takes place in your continence. 
where you were down and, and, and just depressed and just dreary and now you're alive and vibrant and happy and rejoicing. So some of the people really didn't recognize him. And so they, but then they also recognized, well, you know, this, this deed was done on the Sabbath day. Whoa. And so they brought him to the Pharisees. Now some probably were happy and they were rejoicing. They didn't, really, they didn't care if it was a good deed done on the Sabbath day or not. But they bring him to the Pharisees. Verse 13. They brought him to the Pharisees that were for him that was aforetime blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened the man's eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. The people were curious. They asked him. He told them. Now the Pharisees are wondering, how did you receive your sight? And he said unto them, he put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keeps not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They said unto the, the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he opened thy eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. You see, the, Pharisee was, the Pharisees would rather deny the evidence of their own senses than admit that they were in error. So prejudice. So powerful, so powerful is prejudice and so distorting is pharisaical righteousness that it blinds a person's ability to see. Goes on to say in verse 18, but the Jews did not believe, did not believe him concerning, concerning him and that he had been blind and received his sight. And so they called his parents and they said, hey, this is our son, who we say is born blind. Yes, yep, this is him. But you know what? The parents were uh, afraid. They were afraid. And so they didn't want to give an answer. They said, you ask him. You ask him. They, they shun all responsibility. That's a bummer, get thrown under the bus by your own parent. I couldn't imagine how he felt at that time, perhaps discouraged. However, the, the Pharisees, they were in a dilemma because the more they questioned him and the more he got to share, the more the people started believing and what they were saying as the Pharisees and denying Christ, they weren't winning the war. Verse 24, and again he called the man, they called the man that was blind, and he said unto him, give God the glory, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, rather he be a sinner or no. I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How did he open thy eyes? I love how he answers them right here. I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? <laughs> I love to have been standing right there when that took place. You see, they kept questioning him, hoping to confuse his mind, hoping to somehow convince him that this was not Christ that healed him, that some other miracle took place. To deny the evidence of the man laying his hands on his eyes and giving him the command to go, would deny the very power that healed him. He was given glory to God. He was given praise to the one on the throne. But the Pharisees did not want to acknowledge Christ. There's a quote here I have from uh, Desire of the Ages. 
It says, with many words they tried to confuse him so that he might think himself deluded. Satan and his evil angels were on the side of the Pharisees and united their energies and subtlety with, a man, with man's reasoning in order to counteract the influence of Christ. They blunted the convictions that were deepening in many minds. Angels of God were also on the ground to strengthen the men, strengthen the man who had his sight restored. The Pharisees did not realize that, and they had no idea that they were dealing with not an uneducated man, but with divine power that was influencing him to answer them very pointedly that they could not resist his responses. It's amazing, friends. God will come down and he'll help you in your hour of combat. He's not going to abandon you. You don't have to fear because he will be there. He will give you what you need to say in that hour, in that time. Oh, he got, they got upset. Would you also like to be his disciples? Then they reviled him, verse 28, and he said, and they said, thou art his disciples, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Now, he's about to give him a, an amazing sermon in a very short two-minute time. The man answered and said to them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And he goes on to say, Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. <laughs> A marvelous thing it is. He would lay it on them, and conviction would strike their heart, and they would ignore it, and they would harden their heart, and they would dispose of them. They answered and said unto him, you were altogether born in sins, and do you teach us? And they cast him out. However, there's good news. You see, when you stand for the right and you stand for Christ and you go where he tells you to go and you do what he tells you to do, he's right there by your side all the time. And no matter what kind of conflict you run into, no matter what kind of trials or challenges you face, he's there by your side. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and is he that talks with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped. You know, each and every one of us were born blind. Did you know that? The Bible says in the book of Revelations that we are poor, blind, miserable, and naked. Every one of us need the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that we can spiritually discern things. Every one of us were born in darkness. And we have to encounter the living Christ to be brought into the marvelous light. Every one of us need that clay upon our eyes, the anointing that Revelation would call Isav. See, friends, we're to be the light of the world, and nothing is to hinder our work. Nothing is to stop the gospel from going forward. And you see, only as we do will we be cleansed. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, this word go is a familiar word. I'm sure you're, you're, it, you recognize it. Go. Go where? Where are we supposed to go, friends? Go where? 
Go to all the world, right? Before Jesus tells us to go, he gives us a beautiful promise. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go. There is no greater promise given to humanity. There is no greater hope we can grasp than Christ is on the throne, that he owns, he, he owns everything, and he is all-powerful, and there is nothing can hinder his work from going forward if we would but obey. Now, this world faced a crisis about, I don't know, 20 months ago. When was the last time the whole world shut down? Remember? Can you say the flood? Right? That was something to stop the world. You know, there's nothing in the history of this world outside of the flood that has happened that has caused the whole world to stop and think. You think God's trying to tell us something? I believe so. And you know what? By the grace of God and for his glory, not that any of us can boast in this church or those in El Salvador or those in the Amazon or those in the Middle East or those in Africa that decided that when Jesus said go, he meant go. In the face of adversity, in the face of challenges, in the face of difficulty, in the face of shutdowns, in the face of mandates, in the face of closures, he said, go. Nothing supersedes the word of God and the Great Commission. Nothing at all, friends. And by God's grace, as I was looking over my, my calendar, Pastor Ron and I talking to the staff and Pastor Michael, we were talking, and we're looking over our calendar and we're thinking about all the things that God inspired this church to do in the last 20 months. Do you realize we, we have made just about, we have conducted about 40 missions and events and outreaches in the last 20 months? 40, close to 40. We're putting together a video, you'll see that soon, and Pastor Ron and talk more about it, I'm sure, in the future here. Amazing what God has been doing. And had we not gone, Think of all the different things that would not have got accomplished in the world. And you know what? It was the Holy Spirit that did the work. We have nothing to boast about. And so I remember when it started, I remember being back there in the committee room. There was about a dozen of us kneeling down, praying earnestly, Lord, do we go to El Salvador? Do we close it down? 180 people signed up to go on this trip. It's a Sunday, we're praying. Tuesday morning, a small group of us that's going to go down and get things set up, we're leaving. We're going to be down there. Thursday, Wednesday, people start coming down. Another small group comes down on Wednesday. On Thursday, about another 120 people come down. Friday, about the rest of the group comes down, and there's a small group that comes down on Sunday. What do we do? Everybody else is shutting down. Other things are shutting down. How do you know God's will at that time? Do we just go along with what man is saying? Do we go along with the other people that say, you know what, I, I advise you don't go? Well, you advise me, but what does God say? And so we get down and we kneel and we pray. We spent quite a bit of time praying and we get up and we dialogue. And our prayer was, Lord, if this is not your will, turn it out of the way. We don't know how to understand sometimes, but go and see if it gets shut down. And so we went. And we're down there, and Wednesday, I get a call from Brother Corey Bush. He says, I'm here in the airport in Houston. They won't let us get on the plane. I said, really? Well, I'll, I'll call you right back. I call the airlines. Well, we're just, we're not, no outbound flights right now. I'm like, all right. And we hear on the news, El Salvador and one other country in the whole world closed their borders at that time. All right, God, God said, stop. Okay, I'm good with it. Let's find some tickets and get back home. The Lord stepped in, and he saved us tens of thousands of dollars in tickets. But you know what? He allowed us to go through the crucible. He allowed us to be tested and tried to see if we would just, okay, everybody else says, don't do it, we won't do it. No. 
It's a prayer journey, friends. What's your prayer journey? Where is God asking you to go? What is he asking you to do? What is he asking you to give up? What is he asking you to take up? I don't know. But it's a prayer journey, and you need to take it, and I need to take it. Because what he was wanting to do for this blind man was build his faith, build his confidence, and strengthen him so that he could use him, and he could be a witness, so he could be a light in the world, and that's what we're supposed to be. We're the only Protestant denomination with the only message for the end time to prepare people for the coming of Christ. We're the only people that know about the crisis ahead. And what are we doing to prepare and to, to equip ourselves so that others may know as well? However you look at it, we're going to be on this journey because things aren't going to stop and wait for us to catch up. But there's good news because as we go, we're not only cleansed, we're not only healed, but we're empowered and we're invigorated and our faith is built and God continues to reveal greater things to us. I remember when I, when I first shared, started sharing, I didn't know very much about the Bible. But you know what? If you share what you got, you'll get more. The Bible says, given it be given on to you. Sometimes we think it's when we put it in the offering plate. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about everything. Yourself, your brain, your talent, your time. Uh, here comes a, a quote. It's from Amazing Grace, page 61. Each steward has his own special work to do for the advancement of God's kingdom. The talent of speech, memory, influence, property are all t are to accumulate for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. He will bless the right use of his gifts. Everything is to be used for advancing God's kingdom. Your talent, your time, your speech, your treasure, everything. God bought you. He bought me. He redeemed us. We belong to him. We don't belong to ourselves. And you'll find no greater peace, joy, and, and purpose than when you and I surrender ourselves into the hand of God to be used by him. And so, we're going to have an opportunity to be witnesses. So, what is your testimony? And there's going to come a time, friends, that we're going to be brought before magistrates and judges and others. And we're going to have to give an account for what we believe in. And it's not going to be based upon just, oh, I believe this because this is what the Bible says. No, you believe it because you've had a living experience with God and it's touched your heart and it's changed your life. And you don't care what anybody says, you're not selling out. Even if your friends throw you under the bus, even if your family throws you under the bus, even if church members turn on you, you're not going to give up your faith. You're going to stand true and faithful to God. And in the hour of conflict, he'll come along your side and he'll put in your mouth the words to say. And your adversaries will not be able to re refute it. But that only comes if you have a daily relationship with God as you're preparing today for tomorrow. I was sharing with the, the kids over at the school. And, uh, you know, there's things that the enemy seeks to, to utilize to hinder us. You know, there was one thing that could hinder Superman from being Superman. What was it? Kryptonite. Yes. You know, to everybody else, it didn't bother him. You know, everybody else could walk around Kryptonite. didn't bother him. But Superman got around Kryptonite. Boy, that was it. He was done. He was just, he was like clay. What's the enemy's Kryptonite for you, friends? What's he doing to get in between your prayer life? What's he doing to get in between your Bible study? What's he trying to do to get in between your witnessing for Christ? What kryptonite has he unleashed on you? I know I have to be very intentional if I'm going to be connected with God and be an instrument in his hand because it's a battle. Even as a pastor, you think, Pastor, I mean, you just, what do you got to do but read the Word all week? That's all you got to do. Man, I wish that's all I had to do. <laughs> no, we have to be intentional too. And it's not about how much good works you do because the good works aren't going to get us to heaven. It's going to be the one you know. This is eternal life that you know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. 
That's eternal life. And so, yes, we're going to run into some difficulty. We're going to run into some challenges. But God's going to be right there with us. And yes, from within as well as without. This comes from last day events. It says, we have far more to fear within than from without. The hindrances to strengthen and success, I'm sorry, the hindrances to strengthen and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. I couldn't believe that when I read it. I'm going to read it again. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their consistent lives, by their godly example, and their active influence, the cause which they represent. But how often have professed advocates of the truth proven the greatest obstacles, the greatest obstacle to its advancement? The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encourage the presence of evil angels and open the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. The Pharisees had a great deal. The Sadducees, the people of that time, had a great deal of evidence placed before them that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But they shut their eyes to the evidence. They hardened their heart. They were too stubborn you know, today we have things happening in our world. It's interesting. I was listening to Bill Gates in an interview, and he, and he, he admitted that, well, it's not working. The vaccine's not working like we had hoped. Well, you know, it, it has helped some people. Yeah, they benefit from it. But when they changed from saying it was a preventative, now it just helps boost the immune system. The CDC even changed its terminology in regards to what, what, is a, what defines a, a vaccine from being a preventative to boosting the immune system. So he admits it. Okay, so um, how long did it take? How many people suffered? How many people lost their jobs? How many people will continue to lose their jobs because there are still people that won't back up with all the evidence of all the breakthrough cases? You know, pride is a terrible thing. And stubbornness, the Bible would call it idolatry in 1 Samuel 5 or 15 verse 30. Turn with me to um, Proverbs chapter 1. You know, it wasn't too long ago I was counseling a, a, a young man and um, I had asked him, have you seen how God's been merciful to you in your life? Have you seen how many times God has bailed you out and turned things aside so the trouble you were in wasn't as bad as it was looking like it was going to be? And I told him, I said, I want you to go home and read Proverbs 1. We're going to start with verse 23. Turn you at my reproof, he says. In other words, turn at my correction. Respond to my spirit convicting you. Turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit onto you. All right, so this is the key. How many of you want the latter rain? We want the latter rain? That's the key. Respond to God's conviction, to, con I'm, to the conviction that comes from God. Respond to it. Turn at his reproof. Turn at his correction. So I will pour out my spirit onto you, and I will make my words known unto you. Because I have called and you have refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man will regard it. But you have said it not all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity and I will mock when your fear comes. The first time I read that, I thought to myself, what? God would, would laugh at me? 
No, it's not like, ha, ha, ha. It's like, ha, huh, now you want to call on me? Ha, huh, I've been appealing to you for years and years. I, I've, I've opened up many opportunities of mercy. I've shown it to you. Ha, huh, now, now you want to call on me? But you know what? God is limited now. As it would say in Psalm 78, they limited the Holy One through their unbelief. No matter what he would do for them, now they still would not believe he was God. There are people in the world today, no matter how much evidence you give to them, that they are wrong in what they are pursuing or doing or pressuring people into, no matter how much evidence you place before them, they will reject it and go on in their way. You can't do nothing for them. When your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then shall you call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? Why? Next verse. For that they hated knowledge, and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Friends, that's probably the darkest place any human being could ever be in the world. For the turning of away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whosoever hearkens unto me, this is a wonderful promise at the end, I love it. But whosoever hearkens unto me, shall dwell safely and be, feel, and be quiet from fear of evil. There's a quote. I, you know, I cut these little quotes out. I print them out and I, taste them, I paste them in the front of my Bible. They, they're there to remind me of God's faithfulness, of his warnings, of his counsel, to encourage me, to remind me, <laughs> don't grieve the Holy Spirit. This one here comes from Christ's Object Lessons, page 237. And it, it harmonizes with what we just read. Every time, how often? Every time you refuse to listen to the message of mercy, you strengthen yourself in unbelief. Every time, how often? Every time you fail to open the door of your heart to Christ, you become more and more unwilling to listen to the voice of him that speaks. You diminish your chance of responding to the last appeal of mercy. Every time, friends, when God convicts us to go and we don't go, every time God convicts us to give something up and we don't give it up, every time he convicts us to do and we don't do, we diminish our ability to hear his voice. It says, let, let it not be written of you as of ancient Israel. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. Let, none, let not Christ weep over you as he wept over Jerusalem, saying, how often I would have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Now, I remember, friends, the first time I went to do door-to-door. -door. And I remember knocking on that first door. My heart was about to jump out of my chest. I was scared to death. I was a pale, sweaty I, I just didn't think I could do it. But I knew that as it says in the book of Hebrews, I think it's 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those that are heirs of salvation? I knew God sent and commissioned an angel to stand by my side to go to that door with me. I was encouraged by that verse and knowing that he was right there with me. And all I had to do was put my feeble arm up and if it was too far away from the door, the angel would go, and knock on the door for me. He would help me out. And when that person opened the door and I could barely talk, as sometimes I get stuttery up here, I get all nervous. You know what, so what? Speak. Give God an opportunity. I thought about doing a sermon called Unemployment in Heaven. 
I wonder how many unemployed angels there are waiting, just waiting. Oh, if they'll just go out and do what God asked them to do, we could work. That's how they, they fulfill their mission. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for me to go forward and do something. And I remember that person opened the door. We had a pleasant conversation. I had prayer with them. And then I got used to it. It was a little easier each time I go. But then when I, I go for the first time again, I still I, I get jittery. I get a little nervous. I remember one time a lady named Mary Nelson. Her and I went to up to Emmanuel Institute to do some training for evangelism. And uh, we had to go out and do door to door together. And she was really super nervous. And I had done it before, so I wasn't as nervous as her. And uh, we went up and we knocked on a door. And she's like, okay. And she, I said, you pray, I'll talk. All right, all right. And so after about five homes, I said, okay, Mary, you, uh, I need you to do it. You, got, you do it and I'll pray for you. Oh, I don't know, Dennis, if I can do this. I said, you can do it, Mary, come on. And I said, okay, I'll knock. She knocked on the door. It was a pleasant experience. I said, great, Mary, you did it, all right? I'll do the next one. No, you won't. I'm doing it. <laughs> you see, when you experience God working in your life to give somebody else hope, to bring them peace, to, to give them something that they can, they can meditate upon, they can go home and think about, it's life-changing. The enemy's doing what he can to hinder the work. Let not us assist him with unbelief, but let us move forward in confidence and trust in God. He said, go. He's on the throne, friends. He's not coming off that throne until he's coming to get us. And the work is all done. There was a man named Don Ritchie. He lived in Australia. He was known as the Angel of the Gap. He had a beautiful home positioned by a cliff over by the, the ocean. And it was a great uh, tourist uh, would come there and view the scenery. It's a beautiful scenic route passing through there. And he would watch people come and people go, cars pull up, people get out, families rejoicing, taking pictures. Every morning he would sit there and he'd watch. And, and he'd wait for the sun to come up and he would notice at times just a single person would get out. And they would walk over to the edge and they would, they would linger there and they would linger there. And the Spirit of God prompted him, said, Don, go talk to that person. And he'd make his way out of the house across the street and into the, across the little parking lot area there and over by the, the rail that there was a great drop-off point because he knew many people had gone over there and they just decided it was, life was too hard, too difficult, and they would take the plunge. The man saved more than 160 people in his lifetime as he watched every day for that soul that was needing help. He was not afraid about rejection. I would hear him tell his story. He lost some. He lost some. But he would go over and he would, he would ask them, hey, how are you doing today? Get a little conversation started. He could see they were downcast, they were struggling. How are you doing? He'd get a conversation and go, hey, why don't you come back to my house? Let's have a cup of coffee. Let's drink some water together. Let's just talk. Just, you can always come back here again. They'd go to his house. More than 160 people he died, I think, in 2013. But what, a, what an amazing man. Friends, are we watching? Are we praying in the morning? Are we spending that time with God? Are we, are we prepared for a divine encounter through the day? Are we willing to go even though it looks like everything's hedged in and everything's shut down? It's going to happen again. You know what I'm afraid of? That as things kind of wind down a little bit, People are going to shrug their shoulders and say, eh, it wasn't that bad. Last quote here. Great controversy. 
servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to their own will be brought to take their own stand. The message will be carried not so much by the argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Friends, if you're not handing out tracts, I want to encourage you to get some and hand them out. Because it's seed being sown. A Bible promise, seed being sown, words of encouragement, seed being sown. It will have its influence upon the hearts of individuals. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the children of God sever the bands which have held them, final or family connections, Church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take up their stand upon the Lord's side. Do you want to be a part of that work in the end, friends? Is that your desire? You want to experience God transforming your life as you, you share the good news with somebody else? Then we got to get up. We got to go. We can't hold back. Praise the Lord for what we've done. Praise the Lord. The people down there in El Silver, they never stop. They're building that college down there, even though we can't come down and help them out. There are some small groups that went down and worked with them, but they're moving forward. The people in the Amazon, they're moving forward. We went down there. We did some meetings. A Bible worker came in afterwards. 24 people baptized. A church born. Praise the Lord. Now, now they're going out down the river and ministering to other villages and bringing them hope. We can rejoice. Let us not be afraid. Because it's not over. The enemy is not going to give up that easy. Let us press on. And let us stand like the brave. Please stand for our closing song.